A cold night in November of 1782, John Godric and his friend Edward were looking at the mesmerizing night sky full of stars, like so many nights before. John was 18 years old and was deaf. He explored the silent immensity of the universe with much concentration. Suddenly, he noticed that the star Beta Per Se, commonly known as Al Gol, had a dramatic change in its brightness. John, almost hypnotized, persisted looking at the star for an entire hour. This was not the first time that someone had noticed that Al Gol was a variable star, but John was the first person to calculate the period of variation in brightness and explain why this variation was happening. He reasoned that an astronomical object was orbiting around the star and eclipsing it. Like John, many amateur astronomers have made important contributions to the scientific field of astronomy. If John and Edward were alive today, Probably they would have participated in the project Galaxy Zoo. Galaxy Zoo invites people from the general public to classify photographs of galaxies in a web portal. Some of these galaxies have never been seen by human eyes before because these photographs were taken by robotic telescopes. More than 150,000 people participated in the first year of the project Galaxy Zoo. Who could resist the call for looking into the distant reaches of the universe? Other scientific fields have a history of contribution from, for contributions from amateurs, like botany and zoology. For example, passionate bird watchers from the 18th and 19th centuries drew beautiful, detailed illustrations of new species of birds found in the American continent. Today, passionate bird watchers take photographs to monitor the population of new species of birds that are under threat due to climate change and human activities. The success of Galaxy Zoo which has produced 55 publications and scientific publications so far, led to the expansion of the organization and web portal to include other scientific topics like biology and climate. Its new name is Zooniverse. Today, the internet, new technologies, and widespread access to education are fostering a more systematic an extensive participation of citizens in science. And we have a new name for this passion for science, citizen science. Citizen science is a research approach characterized by the active involvement of non-professional scientists in the scientific process. Depending on the project, Non-professional scientists can participate in different stages of the scientific process, for example, <coughs> contributing data, annotating, classifying and analyzing data, formulating research questions in collaboration with scientists, and also helping in the design of tools and methods to conduct a, res a research study. In fact, any of us could do a research study if we have enough motivation to contribute something to the world and seek help from experts. The United Nations Environment Programme, the European Environment Agency and the White House of the United States already recognize the value of citizen science for solving research questions. The vast amounts of data that can be collected and analyzed with public participation increase the statistical power of results. Also, citizen science makes possible the analysis of vast amounts of data that could not be done otherwise. 
the number of scientific publications where citizen science was present has been increasing steadily during the past 10 years, according to an analysis of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, which was published in 2006. In 2016, sorry. So citizen science has a tremendous value for communities and, envi and the environment. Thanks to open participation and public knowledge. But I'm going to illustrate this with a story I lived. In London, Tracy and her neighbors were worried about pollution from traffic. They talked about the dark dust covering their furniture when they left the window open. They were concerned about so many cars passing in front of their children's schools. And they wondered, how could we know if our concerns are really justified? And how could we convince the local authorities that they should take our concerns seriously? Tracy, who was a young and energetic leader, found, found out that there was only one monitoring station near her neighborhood from the London Air Quality Network. This was completely insufficient to know if the air they were breathing was toxic. Later, she found out about the Barbican Citizen Science Project. In the Barbican neighborhood of London, uh, neighbors had teamed up with researchers of University College London and the social enterprise Mapping for Change to monitor air pollution during an entire year. With the data they collected, they were able to bring the issue of pollution from a tunnel with high volume of traffic to the attention of the city of London. Inspired by this example, Tracy decided to contact Mapping for Change, and she learned that they were helping other people in other neighborhoods of London to monitor air pollution. She attended a training session organized by Mapping for Change and collected money among her neighbors to buy the materials needed. I met, I met Tracy in a cold and rainy morning of March in London. That day, she and her friends were going out for the first time to monitor air pollution with all the materials, and I was going to accompany them in their adventure. Tracy was carrying a bag full of diffusion tubes, <laughs> like the one you can see in the picture on the right. And one of, his, of her friends were car was carrying a ladder that they used to get up and attach the diffusion tubes to the lampposts in the street. And you can see the setup in the picture on the, on the left. While doing this, they were taking notes in a notebook about details, the location, time, reference number of the diffusion tube. And also, they input these details in the online application of Mapping for Change. Tracy and her neighbors had chosen 10 locations to monitor air pollution based on their knowledge of the area and the use they make of public space. For example, they know the path their children follow from the school to the parks. And while we were doing uh, this activity, walking from one location to the next, they were commenting to me things like, they were concerned that the local authorities may approve the construction of a lorry passage across the neighborhood. <coughs> the, the, the small parts were threatened by new building plans. And at that moment, I noticed for the first time these small protest banners that were hanging from some of the lampposts and read, parks, not profits. And you can see one of those in the picture on the left. Four weeks later, Tracy and her team went out again, collected the diffusion tubes, and sent them to the lab for analysis. And the lab sent the results to Tracy. She input them in the web platform of Mapping for Chains. And now, everybody can see in this public map the air pollution data that was obtained by Tracy, her team, and many other communities in London. Some of these communities 
are now bringing the is issues of air pollution to the attention of the local authorities thanks to the power and understanding that these research studies they are carrying has given them. And they are sharing this power, powerful information with their London neighbours and in fact with the world. This is just the beginning of a story. A success story that shows the value of citizen science and open participation for communities and the environment. But the best thing about public knowledge is that it is contagious. <laughs> and exactly two weeks ago, on a sunny Sunday of November in Barcelona, I went out, I met some enthusiasts and a university professor here in Barcelona and for the first time in Barcelona we were attaching diffusion tubes in the lampposts of my neighbourhood, Poble Nou, <laughs> in Barcelona. Soon you will see the results in Mapping for Change. <laughs> the secret to this success is easy to use technology that is economically accessible and motivated citizen scientists. Sharing and seeing the results of their research in a public map together with the data collected by other people like them makes them feel part of a wider endeavour. And let me tell you one more example to illustrate how important it is to design technologies that are easy to use and that encourage public sharing. Some illnesses are spread by mosquitoes like malaria, dengue and Zika. The tiger mosquito, who is, which is an invasive species that can cause an epidemic, was detected in Spain for the first time near Barcelona in 2004. <coughs> Experts warned that we should monitor and control the expansion of tiger mosquito because it was posing a threat to public health. But how can we monitor mosquitoes? We would need an army of scientists to do that. Indeed, the project Mosquito Alert has a, a, an army of 40, more than 40,000 citizen scientists. With an easy-to-use mobile application, anybody can quickly learn to identify tiger mosquitoes. If you spot one, open the application, take a photograph with your phone, enable location access, answer a quick question of some quick questions, and send it. An expert will validate it, and soon anybody can see your contribution in a public map where you can see all the detected tiger mosquitoes in Spain. In fact, you could even become an expert for validation. <laughs> Thanks to citizen scientists of the project Mosquito Alert, the first time that um, a tiger mosquito was detected, they, they, for the first time they detected a tiger mosquito in Andalusia and, and in Aragon. And the detailed public map is used to complement other scientific projects and also is helping public health professionals. There are many citizen science projects out there of all topics, for all tastes, <laughs> where we can participate. We could even start our own project. We can learn how to do science, we can learn about something we are passionate about from galaxies to birds. We can help advance human knowledge. We can help change our environment for better. But most of all, we can enjoy our passion for science with our loved ones, like John and Edward did more than 200 years ago, because science is a social endeavor. <laughs>